All right, we're gonna go ahead and do our uh, 6.4 lesson, our final lesson for our ecology unit. And we're gonna be looking at energy flow. This is a pretty uh, straightforward, pretty simple lesson. Uh, mostly, hopefully, because a lot of this is gonna be review for you, stuff that you have uh, already covered, covered probably several times throughout your lifetime. Uh, and we're just gonna remind you of a few of these things one more time. We do have quite a few boxes on our study guide page today. Um, but none of them are, are super long chunks of writing that you're going to be doing. All right, so we're starting here with trophic structure, just to introduce us to what we're talking about. Uh, the transfer of energy throughout an ecosystem, uh, it, it takes place usually in several steps, which is often referred to as a food chain, uh, although we're going to learn a couple of better terms to use as opposed to food chain. Uh, each of these steps in a food chain is referred to as a trophic level, and then an ecosystem's trophic structure is uh, usually going to be a, a complex kind of interwoven web. And so, food web is going to be one of the terms that we're going to prefer to a uh, to a, a food chain, as you may have learned it when you were little. All right, now we're going to start writing here. Energy needs. All living organisms need energy to live. They cannot create energy on their own. They can only transform energy. They're taking a source of energy and then converting it into a form that they can use. And the sun is the main source of energy. All right, so for our trophic levels here, um, don't write anything here and introduce you to these terms and then we'll write on the next slide. Uh, so the first step in the flow of energy is primary producers or what we might also call autotrophs. Uh, these are, are organisms that make their own food and tip, almost always these are organisms that perform photosynthesis. That's what we mean by make their own food. They're taking that energy from the sun and converting it into a form of energy that they can use. And then the second step in the flow of energy of primary consumers, these are, are heterotrophs. I mean, they don't create their own food uh, from, from sunlight energy. And so they need to feed on organisms that do. So these, uh, the second level are heterotrophs who are feeding on primary producers. And then our third step are heterotrophs that feed on the previous level of consumer. I think of it like a, a great white uh, you're not going to see that great white eating plants, right? He's eating something that ate something that ate the plant. Uh, it's several steps farther down the line. So to go ahead and, and define those terms under trophic levels, autotrophs make their own energy, also known as primary producers. Please, please get that down. Very important for the, your test. Uh, and then your heterotrophs cannot produce their own food directly. So they need to eat it from something that has already stored energy in a different way. All right, looking here at our types of consumption. Again, hopefully most of this is review. In fact, if you are comfortable with all these terms, you don't have to write all these down. Uh, these are probably terms, of at least a couple of them that you are familiar with already. So our producers are gonna be your plants. That includes our phytoplankton when we're in our marine ecosystems. Uh, these are our plants that capture energy from the sun. Then we get on to our herbivores, which eat plants, carnivores, which eat animals, omnivores, which eat both animals and plants, and then our detritivores, or sometimes you'll just see it as detritivores, uh, which are going to be our, uh, like our bacteria that will eat away at, at feces or at uh, at, at, at dead things. All right, we get to trophic pyramid here. Uh, just looking at the second bullet point there that's in bold. Uh, and this is, again, this is very important. If there's nothing else that you get out of, uh, out of this lesson 6.4, this is probably the one big thing we want you to wrap your head around. That on average, about 10% of the energy that's transferred to the next level of the food chain uh, so what we mean by that is each, each time you move up a level on that food chain, uh, you're, you're losing roughly 90% of the energy that existed at that level. Only 10% of it is being passed on 
to the next level. We give you a, a visual here of how that works. We've got our phytoplankton, our krill, and our whale. Um, notice that we have lots and lots of energy. That's what the size of the box represents energy and it may also represent mass as well. Uh, lots and lots of energy here. And then when we get to our krill, much, much less energy. And then when we get to our whale, even less energy that exists there at that level. And the same thing can be represented here in the pyramid, referred to as a trophic pyramid. Um, note it's the, it gets smaller and smaller as you work your way up the pyramid. So this represents the amount of energy at this level as well as the amount of mass. Uh, give you an idea of how this might work. You've got your phytoplankton being eaten by a zooplankton, which might get eaten by an even larger zooplankton, uh, which might get eaten by a carnivorous fish, and then finally get eaten by a tuna. So you have, by the time you get to that fifth level of energy, you have lost lots and lots of energy. All of this uh, and only down to to that by the time you're done. And we may add another level on top of this pyramid for those of you who may enjoy a uh, nice tuna sandwich, uh, even more energy than is, <coughs> is lost on its way to us. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So to put that in perspective, uh, when we, if you are one of those tuna sandwich eaters, uh, when we're downing that tuna sandwich, let's say it's providing us with, uh, with 100 grams of energy, the plankton at the very, very bottom of that uh, trophic pyramid had 10,000 kilograms of energy way back at the beginning of that pyramid. So just lots and lots of energy lost by the time you get to the top of a food pyramid. To give you again a, a visual of how that might look, this is how much energy was, uh, was at the phytoplankton. By the time we get to the tuna, it is a, a fraction, a minuscule amount of energy that remains by the time you get to that tuna sandwich. This is why uh, you may hear people talking about trying to eat lower on the food chain. There's so much energy that gets lost when we eat higher the food chain. Uh, there are those who would try to push for us to, uh, to try to eat lower on the food chain, meaning eat, eating, um, eat, eating less meat and trying to focus more on eating those primary producers, eating those fruits and vegetables. All right, so for trophic pyramid, uh, we do want you to go ahead and write this down. Even though the size of the species gets larger as you go up a trophic pyramid, uh, the overall mass gets smaller and smaller. So I mentioned this already. Um, when we look at that pyramid, as it gets smaller toward the top, that's not just representing the energy at that level, it also represents the mass. If we were to add up, uh, would take all of the krill in the world and, and add up their mass together, uh, even though they're much, much smaller than the whale that feed on them, uh, their overall mass would be larger than if we were to add up the mass of all of the whales that feed on the krill. It would be significantly more for the krill, even though the whales are so much larger. All right, we get to types of production. You probably are at least a little bit familiar with this. You should be. We've already talked about it in this class, as well as I'm sure for years now in other science classes, photosynthesis. Uh, this is when producers are changing light into chemical energy. There's a whole chemical formula here. Uh, I'm not concerned of you being familiar with this formula. That you do not have to write that down and have that memorized. Just, just know the basic idea that it's producers who are taking sunlight and converting it into a usable form of energy. There is, however, another form of primary production that is far less common called chemosynthesis. So we do want you to write this down. This is in bold. So chemosynthesis is used uh, by bacteria near hydrothermal vents. This is only at these hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean floor, uh, the places where a hydrothermal vent is, is where heat is, uh, is escaping from the mantle. Um, and so instead of using sun as their energy source, there are these bacteria uh, at these hydrothermal vents that can then uh, use that heat from the mantle as their energy source. Uh, and then also using sulfur and ammonia, they're able to uh, perform a process similar to photosynthesis, but with this heat instead of heat from the sun. Uh, there are entire ecosystems that evolve around these, these bacteria, around these 
primary producers. All right, measuring primary productivity. We're gonna skip that slide, but we do want you to get this one down. We want you to know the definition of standing stock, which is just how uh, marine scientists uh, get a feel for how much primary production is happening within an ecosystem. So the, the amount of phytoplankton within that region, they just uh, measure the amount of phytoplankton in that area, uh, and that's gonna give them a, um, a pretty good measurement of how much primary production is happening in the water. So your standing stock is how much phytoplankton there is. And there's a just quick little image there for you uh, showing our concentrations of primary producers around the world. All right, and we move on to uh, food web. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that a food chain just isn't a great way anymore to, uh, to really describe what is happening throughout an ecosystem. A food web, even though it's more complex, uh, does a much better job of explaining those relationships. A typical food chain, you would have maybe had the, the three steps, going from the phytoplankton to the krill to the baleen whale. Uh, but the reality is there are other things eating that phytoplankton. There are other things eating that krill. And so this just doesn't do a great job of, of capturing what's really happening in nature. And so a food web uh, tries to, to connect all of the dots within that ecosystem. So you've got several things that are eating the phytoplankton. Uh, coming from the krill here, you've got quite a few things that are feeding on the krill, not just the whale. Uh, so it really does a, a much better job of capturing the full picture. There's a little bit more complicated, a little bit harder to create. Um, but, but definitely more accurate. So our definition for food web is a system of interlocking and interconnected food chains that show how plants and animals are connected in many ways. You can go ahead and get that down. So again, food chain, you know, your grass to your rabbit to your eagle there. Um, just doesn't do a great job of, of showing how it works. It's too simplistic. It also is missing the, the turtivores. So rarely are things as simple as grass, rabbit, hawk. It just doesn't work in a linear way like that. It's a much more complicated system. So food webs, again, just do a better job of showing all of the interactions. Uh, last thing that we're gonna point out here, uh, and you'll need to know this for later in the week when you'll be creating a food web, uh, just notice the direction of the arrows. We want you to understand how these food webs work when you're creating it. The arrow moving away from an organism means that it is being eaten. Uh, so the squid are being eaten by the seal. Uh, and when the arrow is pointing to something, that means it's the one doing the eating. Notice for our orca here, uh, all the arrows are pointing to the orca. It's the one doing the eating. There's not anything that is eating it. That's how you would create a food web, which you will be uh, doing shortly. There you go, 6.4, straight and simple. Um, one of my favorite lessons, I, I really like this, uh, uh, this idea of how energy flows through an ecosystem, so I hope that you enjoyed it too. Um, if not, then get all the information down anyway, get ready for your test, and we'll move on to our survey of marine species for Unit 7. That should be fun, what you've all been waiting for. Peace.